So you know how we have these days in our childhood that we can remember like they happened yesterday. I'm sure I can talk to every single one of you in this room. There's some event when you were a child that you remember just like it happened yesterday. And I have one of those days, absolutely. Um, you see, when I was nine years old, my parents moved me from Western Ohio to deep South Texas. And that's a title for another TED Talk, I promise you. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I remember that day because, I, I swear, it must have been 140 degrees. We moved in the middle of the summer. That was a heat I had never felt in my entire life. Um, but somehow we got through that day, um, and we got all, most of the furniture into the house. You know, we got everything in there, and it's, it's getting to be evening time, and that South Texas breeze is blowing in, it's cooling us off. And we sit on the back porch, and we had, you know, these brick columns that hold, hold the overhang of your back porch. And I sat down there, and I looked up onto that brick column, and I saw this gecko. Now, that's something I've never seen before growing up in Ohio, I promise you. But as a nine-year-old boy, what am I going to do? Of course, I'm going to go check that guy out, right? So I take my chair, and I set it up against that brick wall. I get up on that chair, and I go up to grab that gecko, and I got him, and I bring him down, and I open up my hand, and all I've got is a wiggling tail. <laughs> now, I was ticked, right? That was not something that I was expecting. But you know what I know now that I obviously didn't know back then is that was the first time I got introduced to stem cells. You see, that gecko, he wanted to lose his tail, right? Because he can get away scot-free. And two months later, or about three months later, he's going to be able to grow that tail back through stem cells. And the interesting thing now is that we know that there are a lot of organisms out there that can do the same thing, right? They use stem cells to regenerate tissue, to regenerate limbs, and to re regenerate entire organs. The only problem with this is that we can't do this. Okay, we don't really need to regrow a tail, but you know, there are some things that I think we can really learn from stem cells if we could tap this potential as humans and do what this gecko did to me. So it's, and it's actually not because we don't have stem cells. Humans have a lot of stem cells. In fact, we've got a whole bunch of different types of stem cells we can take advantage of. We just got to learn how to use them to our advantage. So before I get into the meat of my talk and tell you a couple stories where chemistry and biology is going to make this happen, I think, I'm going to lay a foundation and talk about some of the different types of stem cells. And the first stem cells I'm going to talk about are probably ones that you've already heard about, and these are embryonic stem cells. Okay, these are the ones that have been popularized in the media for a number of different reasons, but the main thing about embryonic stem cells that I want you to think about is I want you to compare them to like when we were kids. Remember when you were kids and you were told that when you grow up you can be anything you want? Embryonic stem cells can do the exact same thing. They have this amazing capacity to change, to differentiate into every single cell type in your body. A heart cell, a nerve cell, a bone cell, a fat cell. That's an amazing capacity for one, one cell to be able to do this amazing transformation. The other cool thing about embryonic stem cells that you may not know is that for all intensive purposes, they are immortal. Okay? They have this amazing capacity to self-renew over and over and over again. They are immortal. So this combined capacity to be able to differentiate into every single cell type in your body and have this immortality makes them the gold standard still today in stem cell research. There's another cell type that's kind of come on board in the last 10 or 15 years, and this is adult stem cells. Okay, and this analogy is actually a little bit easier for us, mostly in this room, to understand because I want you to think about adult stem cells just like us as adults. For most intensive purposes, right, we're set on our trajectory, right? We've chosen our path, whether we like it or not. We're pretty much set in our trajectory, right? We may be able to wiggle a little left, we may be able to wiggle a little bit right, but for the most part, we're kind of set in our ways. And adult stem cells are the exact same way. They can't differentiate into all the different cell types in your body like embryonic stem cells can, but they have this capacity to change into a couple different cell types based on where they're at or where they came from. And the really cool thing about adult stem cells is that every single one of you in the audience right now has active adult stem cells, regardless of your age, regardless of where you came from, or who you are. And so they're there naturally, and we could figure out how to tap their potential. That could be a very powerful way of actually tackling this new field called regenerative medicine. That's the advantage they have over embryonic stem cells. Another cell type that has actually come on board, and I think to be honest, I think this is a modern miracle in stem cell biology. It sounds kind of fancy, it's a little technical term, but they're called induced pluripotent stem cells. Okay? It's not that difficult to really relate to them, though, because they're just kind of like embryonic stem cells. They can differentiate, they can change into almost every single cell type in your body, but the cool thing is that they're completely different from embryonic stem cells because of where they come from. 
Okay, the controversy right behind embryonic stem cells is they come from human embryos, and that controversy is still out there today. But induced pluripotent stem cells, you know where they come from? They come from you. I can walk out in the audience right now and pick a skin cell off of you, take it back into the lab, work a little magic on that cell, and make that skin cell go back into a stem cell. Amazing technology. Absolutely amazing. If you think about the potential of this, right? If you can take an induced pluripotent stem cell that comes from you, go in the lab, differentiate it, make it to nerve cells or heart cells, we can put those cells right back into you, and the chance of rejection is next to none because they're your cells, nobody else's. Amazing capacity, really, really great technology. I promise you, you'll hear more about these cells down the road. But the thing about all these three scenarios, the embryonic stem cells, adult stem cells, and induced pluripotent stem cells, these are all the good guys, right? They're our friends. They've been our heroes. They have this amazing capacity to help us in regenerative medicine, to do wound care, to help repair our bodies after damage, and even go after some of our most devastating diseases. But I haven't told you the full story. There is a dark side to stem cells, and that dark side reveals itself when we start talking about cancer. The prevailing notion right now is that the root, the literal root of most cancers, if not all cancers, is a cancer stem cell. We have all these horrible stories, right? We have friends and family members that have gone through this amazing, horrible treatment, chemotherapy, these drugs that basically tear your body apart, radiation treatment that really does damage on the entire body. And things look great. Your tumor shrinks, everything's looking promising, but what happens three months, six months, a year later? The cancer comes back. We now believe it's that cancer stem cell that's the cause of the cancer reoccurrence. The other bad thing about this villain, this, this cancer stem cell, is that we believe that it's the cancer stem cell that causes it to spread through your body, metathesis. Cancer stem cells are something we're going to have to figure out how to tackle. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to make stem cells do what we want them to do, to be our friends, to be our heroes, and then stop them from being the villains like a cancer stem cell? Well, that's why you've got an organic chemist up here on the stage. <laughs> I am not a stem cell biologist. In fact, I'm far from it. I'm, I'm, I'm not a biologist. I am an organic chemist. And you may not realize it, but when you go home tonight and you open up your medicine cabinet and all those fantastic drugs that you take, if you drink a little bit too much wine tonight and you have a headache in the morning, that Tylenol came from somebody like me. Okay? Most medicines out there are actually chemical compounds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Most medicines that are out there are actually small organic compounds, okay? Not all chemicals are bad. That's one thing I'm going to make sure you understand. Um, so it's organic chemists, I think, that are actually going to be able to really impact this field of regenerative, regenerative medicine and stem cell biology. And so there's two stories we're going to talk about today where chemists and biologists are starting to come together and start, start tackling some of our most de devastating diseases, and that's going to be heart disease, and we're going to go after cancer, okay? Let's talk about heart disease and, more specifically, heart attacks. We have all these great drugs, right? I worked on actually some of them during my life. Statin drugs that help lower your cholesterol so that we can make sure we don't have high cholesterol. We have uh, blood pressure drugs that reduce your blood pressure in the hopes and intention that we're gonna stop you from having a heart attack. But what happens if you have a heart attack? What are your options? They're limited. They're extremely limited. I promise you if you have a heart attack, you're gonna be on medication for most of your life. If it's a severe heart attack, you may be on a ventricular device. You may actually have a heart transplant. And the fortunate thing, really, really bad thing, is the chance of having another heart attack has just gone up exponentially. Okay? It's a neglected patient population, as far as I'm concerned. Why is it so devastating when you have a heart attack? When you have a heart attack, you know what happens is your heart loses its blood supply. And what happens when your heart loses blood supply is that part of the heart gets damaged. That tissue basically dies. And the only thing that your heart knows what to do to re hopefully repair that damage is to generate scar tissue. Because okay? the last thing your heart wants to do is to have your heart blow out. Because if it does, guess what? You're dead. But that scar tissue is it's the, the adult heart way of making sure the structural integrity of your heart stays intact. And so your heart can still continue to pump blood, but that scar tissue is not heart muscle. And so the capacity to pump blood has dropped off significantly. But you know what we know now? Is that the cells that are responsible for making that scar tissue are adult stem cells. They're actually located on the outside of your heart. The epicardium is where these cells are at, and they are the ones that actually repair the heart and generate scar tissue. That's the only thing that they know how to do right now. 
what we've been able to do is take these cells and take them back into the lab, and we actually generate small uh, compounds in the lab that can nudge these cells and say, hey, instead of generating scar tissue, why don't you just generate a little bit more heart muscle? Because that's what they know how to do. They just forgot how to. And so you think about the way we could potentially treat a heart attack patient in that crucial moment, right? When somebody has a heart attack and their first responder comes on site and has one of these potential drugs that we're working on right now and get that drug into that heart attack patient in the crucial hours, days, and weeks when your heart is trying to repair that damage, even if we can increase your heart's capacity to pump blood by two, three, or four percent, it's a dramatic, dramatic improvement on that outcome for that patient. Amazing, amazing change in the way we potentially could go after, again, a neglected patient population. Let's switch gears now, right? Those are our heroes. Let's talk about our villains and talk about cancer. And more specifically, I'm going to talk to you about brain cancer. Brain cancer is one of the most devastating cancers out there, right? There's a couple different reasons. Obviously, to have cancer in your brain is obviously mostly, for all of us, a very bad thing to think about. The other thing about brain cancer, it is one of the most aggressive cancers that you can have. Okay? And the problem is, is that an average lifespan for a brain cancer patient, do you know what it is? 14 months. And the unfortunate thing is that I have three uncles that are part of that statistic. I hate this disease. I really, really hate this disease. So what are we going to do to be able to tackle brain cancer? The thing we know now about brain tumors is that they are a very, very complex mixture of cells. It's not just one cell type. It's a complex mixture of a whole bunch of different cell types. And that brain cancer is so aggressive because you know a decent population of that, that tumor is cancer stem cells. So we have phenomenal cancer drugs out there that do a great job of shrinking that bulk tumor in that, in that patient. But what happens is those cancer stem cells don't get touched at all. They are amazing. The drug comes knocking on the door and that cancer stem cells knows there's a drug and spits it right back out before it can do any damage, before it can do any harm. They're amazing. They're just like stem cells. They want to be immortal, right? They want to stay alive. They want to be able to proliferate and divide. That's what makes them so hard to go after. But now that we know that those cancer stem cells are there, we are taking them and putting them back in the lab and now trying to identify new compounds that can target those cancer stem cells. You know what's really cool about this technique, though? It's a little different than when you may think what we're trying to do. We're not trying to kill them. I don't need to kill them. All I need to do is to change them. All I need to do is come up with a molecule that can convince that cancer stem cell to nudge it, to push it, to become something a little bit more benign, like a neuron. And guess what? Your brain's full of neurons, right? So if you imagine the way we can do this, we have some phenomenal drugs out there that can shrink that bulk tumor, get that tumor down, and then have another drug that comes in and targets that cancer stem cell and, and hits it and makes it go into something that's much more benign, like a neuron. A completely different new way, a new paradigm of going after cancer. And this could be applicable to a lot of cancers that are out there. So what I hope I've done for you today is to help you understand and to open your mind to think about how collaborations between chemists and biologists, and there's a lot of clinicians and everybody else out there that's helping this endeavor, to use stem cells to have them be our friends, to be our heroes, to regenerate new tissue, to regenerate new organs, and to go after some of our most devastating diseases. But we're going to also use chemistry to stop these guys from being our villains and our foes. Okay? So if you anything that you want to take from this talk, not all chemicals are bad. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>